Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as folks get logged in, and before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping announcements. Um, some upcoming webinars that may be of interest. On Tuesday, September 10th, we'll be doing a presentation on artificial intelligence to enhance occupational exposure assessment and control. And that is with Dr. Jun Wei in the University of Cincinnati. And on Wednesday, September 18th, we're going to be having a presentation on engaging frontline workers to solve ergonomic problems. And that is with Dr. Pilzuk in the University of Cincinnati as well. For more about these webinars and other upcoming events, you can visit us online at cueh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat for anyone who might be interested. And on behalf of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, we're pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, The Challenges in Accessing Rural Health Care in Hawaii, with Yvonne Kim, PhD, LCSW. Few housekeeping items. All participants who logged in for today's session will, um, for the full and complete live presentation, will receive an email tomorrow with a link to an evaluation form that will qualify you for a certificate of completion with one continuing education contact hour. You will be muted during this presentation, so if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A box. And we'll save time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page within five business days. And without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our presenter for today, Dr. Yvonne Yim. Dr. Yim is a Haumana or student of Hawaii. She was raised in Pearl City, Oahu and graduated from the University of Hawaii at Manoa with a master's degree in social work and the University of Arizona with her PhD in organizational leadership and development. And recently in the spring received a certificate of in peace studies from the Matsunga Institute for Peace from the Hawaii, University of Hawaii. Her academic research interests are focused on, focused on the mana'o or insight of persons living in rural communities in Hawaii. She is a licensed clinical social worker with over 25 years of experience working in the islands in acute health care, hospice, community health, and higher education. Thank you so, so much for joining us today and presenting for us. We're looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, aloha kako, um, hello, and mahalo, and thank you to the Center for Occupational Health at the University of um, California Berkeley School of Public Health. Um, for inviting me um, to present my research. I'm very humbled by the thought that my academic passions may be of interest to others beyond the shores of Hawaii. So as Michelle um, initiated um, and explained, um, I am going to be presenting on the challenges in accessing rural health care in Hawaii. Um, so my mana'o or my knowledge comes from two very special places. Um, first is Hawaii, my home, where my culture, my teachers, and my family reside. And then second of all is Japan, which is my new home um, that reconnects me to my ancestral pasts. So hopefully um, sometime in your lives you have, have or will have the chance to visit um, Hawaii. Um, so as, in, as um, a tradition in Hawaii, we begin our conversations with a, a land acknowledgement. Um, a land acknowledgement basically is used by native people and non-natives to recognize the indigenous um, individuals who are the actual original stewards of the lands that we currently inhabit. So I'm gonna read off our land acknowledgement and paying respects to those um, indigenous people. So a land acknowledgement is a simple, powerful way of showing respect. Um, it's a step towards correcting the stories and practices that have impacted indigenous people's history and culture. Um, acknowledgement by itself is just a small gesture, but this beginning can be an opening to greater public consciousness of ancestral sovereignty, and cultural rights and a step towards equitable relationships and reconciliation. As we gather together today in this space, 
um, let us um, acknowledge our authentic relationships and informed action as servants of the lands that you inhabit today. And I'm very grateful um, to my research participants um, who shared their mana'o or their knowledge um, with me and guided me um, to view their world through their lenses. So our learning objects, objectives today, it is my hope that at the end of my presentation that you'll be able to recognize um, the systemic issues affecting rural health communities as they try to ex, um, access healthcare today. Um, I hope that you'll be able to explain the unique environment, um, environmental, economic, and cultural factors that impact the access to healthcare in Hawaii. And then finally, I'm hoping that you'll be able to understand more about the theory of job embeddedness um, and how it impacts the retention of healthcare employees um, in rural communities. So I'm gonna take you on a journey. Um, so the agen agenda will kind of help fulfill this. Um, I'm gonna take you on a journey through the islands of Hawaii. Um, I will be speaking, if you, not, um, if you don't already know, and using some Hawaiian terminology. Um, if and when I do, I will follow up that up with a English equivalent translation. So our journey begins with ikahi or number one, and I'll provide you with an overview or the definition of what is rural. Um, Elua, number two, will talk about the um, rural communities and their health disparities. Ikolu, our number three, um, I'll talk about the implications of job embeddedness as a theory. Um, Eha, number four, I'll go over my research findings um, as it applies to rural um, health communities and job embeddedness. And then Ilima, number five, will be my conclusion. I will sum this all up and I'll um, have time for um, questions. So let's begin. Um, what is rural? So according to the um, um, census data, there is no real one definition of what is rural. Um, they consider rural to include people, housing, and territories that are not within an urban setting. So therefore, any area that is not urban is considered rural. And it's really a definition by exclusion. The 2000 census um, defines urban as two areas, number one, urban areas, and number two, urban clusters. So an urban area is based on population. So if there's 50,000 people or more, it's considered an urban area. Um, if, it's, if they're between 2,500 and, four, and 49,999 people, then it's considered an urban cluster. And it's, it gets very complicated. So what happened in 2020 of the census, they combined these two, um, these two areas, the urban areas and urban clusters, and they labeled them all under urbanization. And in 2020, the United States population, in fact, was 80% urban and 20% um, rural. So when we look at that in numbers, 20% of the population um, um, that is de designated as rural um, equates to about 66 million people. On the other hand, um, areas that are considered urban um, contain a, a, about 265 million people. But as we see through the, through, through the years um, in this green and blue slide, we see that the um, population in the rural communities are, is actually changing. Um, and we can see this, I think, throughout the world where more people who <clears throat> were um, residing in rural areas are now moving into the um, more of the, of the urban areas. And the reason for this is um, a number of factors. Number one is economics. Um, there is a declining employment in agriculture, and extractive industries. And extractive industries refers to those industries that um, cultivate our natural resources like copper um, and oil. So those industries are declining. Um, there's a globalization of manufacturing 
and economic growth in urban areas. Um, and people are just more attracted to jobs that are located in the cities. There are social factors. So people are attracted to better access to education and healthcare, which are often located in the cities. Um, environmental factors. Um, rural areas are greatly impacted by natural disasters and climate changes. Um, and so people are um, um, no longer wanting to having to, you know, deal with uh, uh, enormous hurricanes. And, and so they decide that the, living in the city is a better option for them. And there are social economic factors. So people are attracted to better social um, and economic facilities that are located in the cities that might include healthcare, um, libraries, educational opportunities, better transportation, um, electricity, um, and better housing. And then finally, the location. Um, living in rural communities um, means that you are um, um, distance with your neighbors. Um, there are inadequate public services like um, buses. Um, and so people decide that living in urban cities is just a more convenient environment for them and their families. So how does this also then translate to rural communities in Hawaii? So according to the data by HRSA, which is the Health Resource and Service Administration, um, Hawaii has about 1.25 um, million people living in our urban spots and about 200,000 people living in our rural areas. And what's interesting about this number is that of the you know, 1.25 million people, they're only occupying about 5% of the land mass, while the 200,000 people um, are, are scattered throughout the rural um, lands of Hawaii, which is about 95% of our entire state. And this diagram, this picture, um, shows that the dark blue areas, um, if it's blue or sort of turquoise, are our rural lands or what is designated um, by the um, census data as rural. And the light beige area um, is the area that is of, of, of urban um, urbanization due to pop population. And on that particular island, that is the island of Oahu, which is our um, major island, which has Honolulu and Waikiki and uh, most of the, um, um, the um, tourism area, okay? So when we look at rural populations specific to Hawaii, um, we see some interesting um, um, differences, but yet we also see the similar trends as we do in the continental United States. Um, so this is a breakout of the different counties of Hawaii. We have four different counties, um, Hawaii County, Maui County, Kauai County, and Honolulu County. And when this, and, and the numbers show that, yes, definitely there are, um, there is a difference in the amount of people living in rural um, areas compared to the urban um, 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 cities and, 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 and neighborhoods. But what I wanna highlight here is the island of, of Hawaii, and which is the county of Hawaii. Um, they're quite different. Um, they have much more individuals still um, living in the rural communities um, versus the urban communities. So part of my study wanted to really look at what are these individuals um, um, experiencing in terms of how are they accessing their own health care? So health disparities um, for rural communities in Hawaii um, are, a again, a little bit different um, in my research um, compared to the continental United States. And I'll go over what the differences are in, in, in this slide. So health disparities are often characterized by indicators such as higher incidence of disease, disability, um, there is delay in care often, um, higher mortality rates, um, there's lower life expectancies and higher rates of comorbid illnesses. Um, health disparities of persons living in Hawaii 
um, in the rural communities are often magnified due to their geographic isolation, um, their lower socioeconomic status, um, their higher rates of healthcare, health risk behaviors, and limited access, again, to um, healthcare specialists. And when I talk about healthcare specialists, I'm not just referring to the physical health, um, but I'm also referring to um, mental health, dental, um, um, eye health, and the like. Um, so our geographic isolation is um, very unique compared to the continental United States. So Hawaii is the only state that is divided um, by ocean um, into eight different separate islands. Um, Hawaii is approximately 2,300 um, miles from California and about 3,800 miles from um, Japan. Um, our location is the furthest from any landmass in the world and is the most remote island chain in the world. Um, commercial air travel is the only public transportation between islands. We don't have ferries. Um, and the average person um, pays between, um, on average, 70 to eight to $200 one way if they are to travel between islands. Our air travel is not an option for persons who may be medically fragile. Um, and in these situations, um, the individual um, needs to hire a, pri a private transport um, that may cost them between $5,000 and $15,000. So it's quite expensive if, you're, if you are medically fragile. Rural air, um, residents must use air travel um, um, to go to urban hospitals for specialized care. Um, and these, these care um, might be as simple as, you know, getting an MRI. Um, I have patients that have to travel um, for radiation treatments, um, um, invasive surgeries, um, psychiatric care, and most other dental, and most a lot of other, other types of dental treatments. Um, individuals that live in our um, rural communities experience higher poverty rates. So according to the economic service, um, the average rural per capita income in 2022 um, was $51,650 for rural um, families. The poverty rate in rural Hawaii is about 14% as compared to 10% in the urban areas. About 7% of the rural population um, has not completed um, or, or are not able to complete high school. And the unemployment rate in, in rural um, areas is about 4%. Uh, many rural residents receive state benefits such as SNAP and Medicaid insurance. So now we'll talk about the unemployed and the uninsured. Um, despite having a relatively unemployment rate in May of 2024, which hit a low 3%, um, the cost of living in Hawaii remains extremely high. Um, I, I'm sure we have all seen that in our communities. Um, so since July of 2023, just to put things into, into perspective, um, the, cons the Consumer Price Index um, for Hawaii, which accounts for um, all of the... Um, consumer costs to, that we pay for water and sewer um, and sales um, and excise tax um, averaged out to, about, to be about a 5% increase. And it's important to note that the unemployment rate of 3% does not distinguish between persons who are underemployed um, and therefore not eligible to receive employer um, sponsored um, compensation or health benefits. Educational disparities. There are teacher shortages in many of our rural communities. Um, and this impacts student learning and their access to um, jobs and other types of services. Um, often positions such as librarians, um, sports coaches, um, and subject matter experts, such as those that teach a foreign language or AP courses are left vacant. Um, often what this means is that students suffer and may have fewer opportunities to engage in a particular sport or even um, higher, higher course levels like AP courses. 
And then finally, um, one of the um, areas of concern are the environmental disparities um, related to climate change. So Hawaii is located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, the lands are particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Um, expected impacts include higher temperatures, um, rising sea levels, um, changes in our, in our um, rainfall patterns, and um, more in, in frequent storms. Individuals with pre-existing health conditions, the elderly um, and children are the most vulnerable um, to the health impacts of cultural of climate change. Um, individuals uh, may experience or have pre-existing health conditions that can be exasperated by um, climate change. Uh, and it might, might be even more challenging for them to readily evacuate or access emergency services during extreme weather events. Um, and we did see this um, about a year ago when we had the uh, Maui Lahaina fires that devastated the rural area of Lahaina where the majority of people um, who perished in those fires were the elderly and children. So now I would like to um, share with you um, a cultural model um, and it's shown here on your screen and, I'm, and I give credit to the Papa Olo Lakahi um, Agency, which is, which is an agency that services Native Hawaiian and their healthcare needs for illustrating this beautiful um, model that is called the Ahu Pu'a'a model. Um, so the Ahu Pu'a'a model um, emphasizes the intersectionality between people, land, and their spirit. And this is a very traditional model. Um, we no longer see this um, in Hawaii today, but the values that this model um, depicts is, is still flowing through the bloods of, of many of our, our uh, rural communities. So the Ahupua'a model um, promotes collective healing it promotes res resilience by increasing um, protective factors and decreasing risk factors. So the native Hawaiians thrived in Hawaii for centuries before the Western contact. You, and we utilize sophisticated resource management systems known as the ahupua'a. It was a wedge shaped um, system divided land that interconnected um, sections extending from the mountains, so of the, uh, or Malka, to the ocean of Makai. So again, it is a um, model that um, utilize the land and landscape um, extended from the mountains all the way down to the ocean. So it was a self-sustaining um, model for the, for the people in the communities. Um, this was an efficient and self um, um, sustaining land resource management system. And the system helped solve a lot of their problems, such as exploitation, um, poverty, homelessness, and starvation. Um, the aina, or the land as it remains today, is a very vital part of the Hawaiian culture. Um, we value our plants and our animals as it represents both physical sustenance and cultural identity. And we recognize um, that through a holistic view, which includes strong connections and reciprocal relationships um, between people, land, and the community and spirituality, that it's key, all of these factors are key in developing health and wellness. By embracing a culturally grounded approach, we can empower and uplift our community to reclaim and celebrate the unique cultural strengths that have kept our people healthy and thriving for generations. So the Ahupua'a model offers a way to implement cultural practices that are essential in promoting wellness for people and families and communities. It becomes the responsibility therefore of the community to lessen the, the perpetuation of health disparities while enhancing protective factors such as family connections, traditional knowledge, and respect for the land. Um, one particular agency um, located in Honolulu is called the um, Kalihi, Kokua Kalihi Valley. 
um, health center. It's a native Hawaiian health center. And they have attached to the health center um, a lo'i or, or, or area of a, a garden. Um, and when their um, clients need to reconnect with the land, um, the healthcare staff actually helps them go into the lo'i and help cultivate um, taro um, or other types of indigenous plants in order to help them uh, feel more connected um, to their traditions. And this has proven very well in the overall um, mental and physical wellness of individuals. So rural communities throughout the United States are expecting a profession, um, professional healthcare shortage. So not only in Hawaii, I think it, this, this is an issue that throughout um, the United States. Um, in 2020, the Hawaiian physician workforce estimated that a physician statewide shortage in Hawaii was about 29%. Um, of that, however, we noticed that in rural communities, um, we were facing the greatest impact um, of the physician shortage. And we they calculated that to be about 50%. While medical and nursing school programs have implemented ways that address the shortage um, through um, grad, graduate school, loan repayment, or low cost tuitions for students um, that are, um, are living in rural communities and wanting to uh, um, obtain a higher education. What we've seen through the years though, is that these programs are only a temporary fix to lure professionals to our um, rural communities, um, but do not address employee retention. Um, participants usually eventually leave the rural communities once their loan repayment obligations um, have been met. Also, um, the Healthcare Association of Hawaii uh, released a report um, that the need for healthcare professionals has grown in our state by 76% over the past three years. And yes, of course, this is a um, direct um, influence by the COVID pandemic. And on average, we have a current uh, vacancy rate about 17% throughout the state. Um, we have a very... Um, High turnover, about 20%, um, losing um, a lot of our healthcare pro professionals um, to the continent, to the United States. Um, and the average length of time to fill a position um, may be between six and 12 months. And this is a picture of just a few of our beautiful um, rural healthcare um, agencies throughout the state. So what was my problem statement as I did my research? So this is the problem statement that sort of guided me um, through my research. And that was due to a highly competitive healthcare environment, leaders in rural healthcare centers struggle to maintain a consistent workforce needed to care for our Hawaiian communities. And as I did my research, um, um, the competitive healthcare environment um, also meant that the island of Oahu was a competitor. Um, that within our state, the he healthcare centers are actually competing against each other in order, or competing against one another in order to get the healthcare professionals um, that they needed for their particular um, community. What was the importance of my study? Um, I really wanted to understand the connection between rural health workers um, experience with job embeddedness. And I'll go over um, with you what that, um, what job embeddedness um, truly entails. So job embeddedness, um, job embeddedness has been recognized as one of the key factors in addressing employee turnover. For decades, past research focused on reasons why individuals cho chose to leave jobs. While job embeddedness, embeddedness took a different approach, um, the theory wanted to study why persons stayed in their jobs. So Mitchell and Lee in 2001 um, did, the, I think, one of the most original studies on job embeddedness. Um, and they actually termed um, their original study as voluntary turnover. 
And it's, these factors are, um, and what they discovered that was that there were factors um, or links between the organization and actually the community that impacted the employee retention. Um, their research defined three specific constructs, and they were the fits and the links and sacrifices. And it's these constructs that impact the workers' um, voluntary turnover, or it impacted why employees chose to stay um, in their jobs. So what are these constructs? So fits um, defines how well the job and the working environment suits the employee. Um, important components of fits that, that the employee and the organization uh, may include are, um, is the organization or is the employee's career goals being met? Um, are their personal values being met? Um, are they um, utilizing their skills, knowledge, knowledge and abilities in their jobs? Um, there was a, a, often a term called, are, are your employees working up to their license? And if they are, then they are experiencing a good fit. Um, the links are the connections that people have with other people or uh, other persons or activities. Um, the number of connections, formal or informal, that a person has with the surrounding community um, and the organization. Um, some of these examples are, are, are do they own a, their own home? Um, do they have close relationships with um, people in their organizations and in their, and in their communities? Um, the literature talked about um, people at work um, actually affirming that they have someone that they, that they could call a best friend um, was a, a good sign of a link. Um, there were also family links. Um, if individuals are living um, um, with a family or with their own family, they, the links might be, um, are the children enjoying their schools? Um, do they have friends? Um, are they involved in extracurricular activities? So if these um, um, experiences were very high, um, then we could um, uh, uh, say that the employee had a good uh, had good links within the community and the and their organization. And then finally, we looked at some of the sacrifices in um, in in the in the research. So sacrifices are um, the perceived loss or the perceived costs of the psychological benefits that might be forfeited if the individual leaves. Um, so some of the sacrifices that um, um, an employee might experience if they leave is that they might be um, no longer involved in a worthwhile project, um, probably a, a project they, that they're actually championing or very, very interested in and in seeing to completion. Um, they may be lost, um, losing out on, on some job perks, some, some benefits of, of being on, in, um, working in that community. Um, they may be experiencing community sacrifices, um, such as they by moving away from the community, um, they may be losing out on the sense of safety, um, the sense of being part of a active um, community that goes out hiking, um, fishing, um, um, those types of outdoor activities that they really, really enjoy doing. Um, so th it's the fits, the links, and the sacrifices that are actual constructs that Mitchell and Lee um, studied that impact an individual's connection um, to their job. Um, and that, that formulation is what they call job embeddedness. So a good way to kind of um, imagine what job embeddedness is, is to, in, in, um, to look at it as a spider web. So job embeddedness is the interlocking, it's the engagement, it's the um, ability to feel connected, just like one does in, in a, a spider web, um, to their organization and to their, organ um, their, and, and to their community through the fits, um, links, and the sacrifices. Some of the research um, that Mitchell and Lee have done over time um, isolated some of the um, statements that people have expressed that makes, um, that connects them to job embeddedness. Um, so statements 
for example, are, I feel attached to this community. I feel attached to my organization. Um, it would be difficult for me to leave. Um, I'm committed. I feel committed. Um, I simply could not leave this community, neither that I work and I live in. Um, it's, it wouldn't be easy for my family or for, for myself to leave. And um, finally, um, myself and my family feel tightly connected to this community and, and to this organization. So job embeddedness plays a, a mediating role for um, employees to become more committed to the work where they feel more empowered to make life choices that connect them to the organization and to the communities. So my research really focused on um, what is the level of job embeddedness um, in the rural communities of Hawaii? And does job embeddedness really play a part in the retention of healthcare professionals um, in our rural communities? So my study was a qualitative design. Um, I used in vivo to help analyze um, a lot of my um, interviews. So my data collection began in March of 2020. Um, one of the downfalls of that is that it was the start of the pandemic. Um, it happened to coincidentally um, align itself. And so rather than being able to go and travel to the different islands and speaking to individuals in person, um, I needed to do that um, telephonically. My, my participants ended up being 10 female participants who were actively working in healthcare. Um, they were nurses, uh, pharmacists, um, healthcare administrators, and social workers. Um, they worked on the islands of Maui, Molokai, um, Oahu, and the Hawaii Island. Um, their length of stay in, in their current employment was about on the average of 12 years. And the primary ethnic um, identification um, they reported were Caucasian, um, Chinese, Japanese, and Hawaiian. So um, while my findings all in all on, in, in its totality aligned with previous research done on job in, embeddedness, and it kind of confirmed um, the uh, fits, links, and sacrifices, um, I did um, discover that were that there were two um, areas um, that were a little different um, from the original research, and they were actually what it turned out to be. It turned out, turned out to be values, um, Hawaiian values that set apart. Um, I think my research from from past studies. So the values that came. Um, or that were spoken of consistently through uh, my interviews were the values of kuleana or duty and lokahi or balance. So kuleana was spoken about as their responsibility or their duty to remain connected to the land. Um, their connection to the land or the aina um, and to their ancestor, ancestors defined their duty to care for their community. So it didn't, it, their kuleana embedded them um, to remain um, working in their rural community. Lokahi was a value defined as building harmony and balance. Um, Lokahi is a value where the community resources are shared equally and equally distributed. And for many of um, my interviewees, they spoke of Lokahi as their ability to share their gifts. Um, to share the resources, um, and that gave them um, a purpose to stay within their, their rural communities. Um, so the earlier illustration that I shared with you about the Ahu Pu'a'a model um, embraced the values of Kuleana and Lokahi. Um, participants believe that this value tied them to their people, their land, and therefore their organizations and their communities. Um, the um, my participants were not born and raised. A few of them were not even born and raised in rural communities. They were born in more of the urban um, locations. Um, but for some reason, they um, received, they obtained jobs in the rural community, communities and they 
voice to me that it was the community that actually taught them and embraced them with these um, values of Lokahi and Kuleana um, that made them actually uh, feel uh, planted. Um, and, and they stayed for many, many, many years. So I would like to, again, just emphasize the, the meaning um, of um, Kuleana and Lokahi through the eyes of our Kumu, um, Kumu um, Pukui and Elbert, who said that Kuleana is having a deep rooted duty and a sense of obligation, um, being responsible, answerable and accountable to something that's within, that is within our control. Lokahi means harmony, it's balance, it's to be in, in, in agreement, um, to be unified. Um, and so these are important values that once, um, that stemmed from our traditional Native Hawaiian um, people and through generations and generations, um, we're seeing it more and more as an important connector um, within healthcare. So now I, I wanted to share with you some of the um, exact quotes that um, my participants um, shared with me that um, embrace these two values. So one person said, I see the importance of kuleana or duty um, to oversee the lives of my patients. And when I do, I oversee the lives, not only of the, that person, but also of their family, of their ohana. My kuleana, my duty is to care for my community. Um, the health of my community from keiki, the children, to kupuna, the elderly, is based on lokahi. It's creating this balance, balance, this understanding. Um, and then finally, we are all connected. We depend on each other. No one does more. No one does less. Um, we all do together. And that is, again, the essence of maintaining balance, that my duty to you um, and you have duty to me and we take care of one another. And that was a very sort of a very um, um, unique aspect of why people stay embedded in, within their communities. So limitations um, to my research research um, is that, you know, it, it, there, because it is specific to Hawaii um, in this particular population, um, you know, there are risk of, of saying that this is a generalizable study um, because it's very limited to the sample that I used. Um, the data an analysis um, is quite subjective. Um, I was the only one that interpreted the, um, the interviews um, and that all participants were female. Um, therefore, it excluded males or other gender identities. So implications, what does this mean um, for organizational leaders in Hawaii um, or even individuals living um, in rural communities? So it calls attention to our healthcare leaders, our human resource professionals, policymakers, um, business leaders to study, fund, and sustain current um, HRSA or um, programs that benefit rural communities. Um, especially looking at how can we create programs that help our um, rural communities um, stay embedded in their jobs. Um, for academia, um, programs um, can be developed that add, add to the curriculum um, a cultural community engagement focus, um, teaching um, um, students about cultural and um, community engagement. And then finally, to look at ways to cultivate community engagement that link newly hired um, um, individuals to the community and to the organization. And this might be um, looking at how to engage new employees and families into the community, using the community to teach about culture um, and spiritual events. And offer um, and encourage the community um, to invite um, um, newly transplanted people in, um, 
to their communities um, in local festivals, um, in songs, in dance, um, in other types of um, um, activities such as fishing, hiking, and the like. So it's really utilizing the community, um, which is um, not really officially done when we look at onboarding individuals, but using the community to help engage the um, employee um, to be part of not only their, their organization and their work, um, but also um, in the land and in, in the culture of, of Hawaii. So that really brings me to the end of, of, of my presentation. Um, mahalo means thank you. Um, and I appreciate the time and, the, and your attention. Um, I'm not sure if there's any questions, Michelle. Yes, thank you so, so much for your research and also for your presentation. Um, to those of you joining us, you're welcome to enter your questions into the chat. We do have some time to address any questions that you might have. Um, I, I'll start by just saying I was really struck to consider how geographically isolated Hawaii is. That's it's something I guess I, I, I knew but didn't fully comprehend, perhaps, is, yeah. is yeah. thinking. And, and also the fact that there's not really ferries available, that airfare yeah. is, is really the way to get around. Um, and just thinking yeah. about the cost of flights and also the ability for folks who can't fly due to health reasons or other reasons. Um, I would that really stood out to me. Absolutely. Um, so thank you for kind of putting context around that. Oh, point. you're very welcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a challenge. It's a really a challenge. Oh, my goodness. Yes, I imagine. Um, well, and the other question that this kind of surfaced for me as well, and especially thinking about healthcare in rural communities, and, and following the pandemic, if there's been an increase in telehealth or telemedicine, if that's something that um, I guess with telehealth also brings up access to Wi-Fi, computer, <laughs> and, you know, internet speeds, the ability to do video appointments, those sort of things. But I was curious if you have any information around telehealth and if that's something I, that yeah, is, I do, is used often in rural areas or not really. Yes. And so um, then that was, is one of the positives that, that had fallen out from the, the pandemic. Um, and you're absolutely correct. Um, the Wi-Fi or even the cost to have Wi-Fi. Um, or a computer um, is not often is, is a luxury in the rural communities. And so many of the healthcare centers have um, built um, what we call like um, telehealth um, hubs. So individuals can actually go to the centers um, and their their private rooms with computers and Wi-Fi um, connectability where the individual can then have these um, consultations. Um, so they have uh, worked around that. And 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 um, it's proven very very successful, especially in the area of behavior health. Um, so people can now get counseling um, through that method. Um, I was recently involved um, in providing telehealth to individuals living um, on Maui who were affected by the Lahaina fires, and that was a very interesting um, um, process, but a very very successful one because we were able to. Um, meet with and help um, diffuse some of the um, um, emotional fallout that came from that um, devastation. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing and also making that those services available. I'm sure they were very much needed and, and telehealth made is a, a help, a big step in that, making yeah, sure that things are accessible in times of need. So thank you. Um, another question that surfaced um, is also thinking about when you're looking at physician shortages and nursing shortages, clinicians in general, um, travel nursing or travel medicine. Do you do you see a lot of folks who come in? I know um, I've seen and actually some of my friends are nurses and they've looked at different travel nursing opportunities of like, oh, maybe I'll go here and, and work there for a few months. I'm curious if that's something that you also see on the islands or not quite as much. Yes, so in the urban areas, um, it is. It's it's a, it's a great, fabulous resource um, for those centers. It's a it's a high cost though for a rural communities. So the rural communities, um, um, because many of them um, have uh, state funded insurance, um, the reimbursement to the hospital is a lot less, and so 
they're not able to turn over the revenue as much as compared to the urban um, larger hospitals. And so that is one of the, 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 um, the struggles for community health centers is that they don't have the resource, the financial resources to pay the high cost of travel nurses. Um, they also, they don't have the facility to house these individuals. Um, there, there are no large hotels um, available uh, for travel nurses. And so that's also, or traveling health professionals. So that's also a struggle um, that the rural communities face. Well, yeah, thank you for so much for highlighting those challenges. Absolutely. Um, we do have someone who added, it's not a question, but just a comment that they wanted to, to share. Um, they've visited multiple Indian reservations, and it's interesting to note that some of the same issues regarding health disparities, access to health care, um, are prevalent across Indigenous communities there as well, and lack of government funding, resources, etc. Um, so just drawing yeah. some parallels with some um, Indian reservations as well. Yes, that's a very good point because, and there there have been conferences um, with the indigenous communities um, um, between um, the whole um, Hawaii community as well as um, the American Indians, and we did definitely see this overlap, um, not in terms of just um, resources, but in terms of historical trauma, um, emotional, um, physical um, issues as well. So yes, there's a, there's a proliferation of new research around that, which is very, very exciting. Thank you. Um, another question that came up, now I've got to find it again. Um, just a note, really enjoyed the, the idea of community engagement and the way in which being embedded in the community also creates a job embeddedness, um, sense of place. Um, and they're wondering if you could expand upon that a little bit around what are some, I guess, specific ideas of how, how would a, an organization, um, an employer, work with the community in order to create opportunities for that embeddedness and that engagement? If you have any ideas or suggestions you're able to share. Yes. So in one particular um, hospital uh, where, where I was able to actually connect with the administrator, she was very fascinated with job embeddedness. And what she did after my research was she actually took, um, identified leaders in the community. Um, and so um, when a new employee was onboarded, um, she would connect this new employee and their family to the, these leaders or these stakeholders within the community. And they, these commu um, stakeholders sort of um, blanketed the, the new employee and actually showed them around, um, introduced them to different um, pockets of people, taught them about the culture, um, about foods, um, about um, learning about what their interests were. So it was just a, like a, a, a 360 degree sort of um, support that that enveloped this new family and, 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 and worker. Um, but it was a very intentional and, de and deliberate um, um, process that the hospital administrator took upon herself because she was in, in a transplant to the island and she realized how difficult it was for her to assimilate. And so she realized, you know, that there are ways, there are community members that want to be involved, that want to show their aloha to newcomers. And so she just took these individuals and she started a sort of a, like a, a community mentoring program. Um, and so that's one way of how she sort of took advantage of um, the new sort of uh, her new knowledge about job embeddedness. Um, so that's just, just one example of how the, how the community can be that support to new individuals. And we see it in um, schools. You know, we, we see that um, where there's a new child in, in, in that is in, um, enrolled in school the school assigns that student, an, uh, uh, a student that has been attending that school and that, that shows that new student um, the ropes, you know, how to get their lunch, how to, how to you know, go here and there. And so we're just implementing that same focus and that model by now including the community. And, and believe me, the community wants to be involved because they see the value of keeping that new employee embedded in their community. Um, so I hope that answers your question. 
Yeah, absolutely. It also makes me think of um, the, I shouldn't say it's been more recent, but I guess our, our center specifically has been focused on this more as like research to practice, but really making sure that it's a community derived research to practice from how are you asking the research questions? What questions should we be asking? Has, has the community informed these questions yes. that we are asking? Um, who needs these resources? What's going to happen when this research is completed? Who gets it? How do they get it? <laughs> what what information is needed um, by, by folks? Um, and, and also just kind of candidly, our, our students, we've seen a lot of that coming from the students who are enrolled at, at Berkeley, at least, um, I would imagine other schools as well, is just that interest in wanting to be, have that community embeddedness as a part of what they're doing on campus. Um, so I just, I really appreciate that perspective and, and surfacing that, that's so awesome. Um, we do have another question. Um, has the federal government been involved in helping to solve these issues or providing resources to try and solve these issues? Not to my knowledge. Um, what the federal government um, has been doing, really they look at um, the um, healthcare centers and all, all, although they see these centers as, as, as valuable entities within communities, they're always looking at you know, how do we cut back um, on some of our funding? Um, so it gets in, in, you know, in, into this, this cat and mouse type of relationships. Um, and like many of the um, healthcare um, centers um, in, in our rural communities are looking at alternative ways of um, funding their own centers. And, and, and so it, it gets very, very complicated. Um, I think, Again, because of the of the um, the effects of the pandemic, the federal government has realized it, the important role that rural community health centers play um, in in keeping the community healthy. Um, you know, if you can imagine, these rural communities are sort of just congregated together, and during the pandemic, um, you know, we, we saw in, in one particular area. Um, you know, and, and how they trace back um, the origins of, of the um, of the of the COVID disease. It came from a supermarket, and and it, it just spread and spread and spread throughout the community. And so I I um, know that the um, um, federal government realizes that, that there is a vital importance of maintaining and funding and keeping the funds flowing through community um, rural health agencies, because the devastation can be quite impactful um, if we don't. Thank you so much. And, and again, thank you for your time today. Um, we're coming to a close, but I just wanted to say, is there any final thoughts or final comments you'd like to leave our, our audience with here today? If any of you are, are interested um, in um, looking at ways to improve your own rural communities, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd be more than happy and honored to um, have current, um, continued dialogue around this subject matter. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Yim, for your presentation, for your research, and for sharing that with, with our audience here today. Um, thank you to everyone online who joined us for, for maybe a lunch and learn if you, if you were eating during the presentation or doing anything else. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned before, this presentation was recorded, so um, it'll be on our YouTube channel within the next five business days. And, and be sure to check out our website for more information. You can register for upcoming events, more webinars. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for, for sharing your important work with us today. Mahalo.